Well, welcome to part two of our discussion on managing historic landscapes and gardens. In this session, we'll veer from colonial mansions and examine issues and treatments involving more complex sites, including universities. We'll first look at Maymont, a hundred-acre Gilded Age estate located on the James River in the middle of Richmond. It's owned by the city and maintained by the Maymont Foundation as a public amenity. Its Romanesque mansion is set in an English-style park, which includes two special ancillary gardens, which we will discuss shortly. The park itself is a demonstration of a landscape allowed to mature naturally. It was laid out beginning in the 1890s and included an extensive variety of trees, forming a Victorian-style arboretum. This 1920 aerial photo shows most of the trees as still quite young. When we compare it with the recent photograph, we see how most of these same trees have reached the prime of their maturity. So this is a case where natural growth, rather than a manipulation of trees or plants for special effects, was the intended form of management. As for Maymont's ancillary gardens, we'll first look at its Italian garden. The garden is in the form of a terrace stretched along the edge of a steep slope. It's laid out in formally planted flower beds, backed by a long colonnaded pergola. Closing the end of the terrace was a tall evergreen hedge, a feature that prompted questions. Now, please avoid looking at the silly fountain jets in the foreground. Fortunately, they have since been replaced with a central fountain more correct for the period. But our focus is on the hedge. Why is the hedge there? When was it installed? What purpose does it serve? Since there were no good answers to any of these questions, we ask why keep maintaining it? No indication was found that it was an originally intended design feature, so removal was determined to be a justifiable treatment. The removal opened up a lovely romantic vista focusing on a garden pavilion in the distance. It also revealed the original retaining wall forming the edge of the terrace. Seeing these features gave reassurance that the hedge blocked an intended vista. Now, this is an early spring view before the borders and stone containers had been planted, and a midsummer view offers a lusher panorama. The noted landscape architect Stanley Abbott called this type of judicious intervention painting with a saw. Now, below Maymont's Italian garden is the Japanese garden, one of the estate's most popular attractions. The garden is an important expression of the popular late 19th century Japanesque mode. A highlight of the garden is a much-admired waterfall splashing over what was once a quarry. Several years ago, someone donated a photograph of the garden taken in the 1920s. Close examination of the image revealed a structure perched among the rocks. This was identified as what the Japanese call an ejumaya, a rustic pavilion meant for contemplating the scenery. Well, the structure disappeared years ago and remained long forgotten, but archaeological investigation confirmed its site and footprint dimensions. So the decision to reconstruct this unique architectural accent was enthusiastically approved. Builders with expertise in traditional Japanese construction techniques assisted with its fabrication. And the result is a very Japanese scene. My point with these two examples, Maymont's Italian and Japanese gardens, is that you never cease learning from historic gardens. Always probe them with questions, and don't insist on telling the garden what you think it should have. Take the time to let the garden tell you what it should have. As with the Italian garden's hedge, the existence of a landscape feature in a historic garden, no matter how long it's been there, is not exempt from questioning its purpose. And as for the Azumaya, 
There's no telling when new information will surface and guide an intervention. Before we leave Richmond, I want to discuss another case of landscape management. This is Monumental Church, a National Historic Landmark, an architectural masterpiece by Robert Mills. The church ceased as an active parish in the 1960s and is now owned by the historic Richmond Foundation. Several years ago, a former foundation director grew concerned about the two large willow oaks flanking the church, asking why are they there? Not only did they obscure the view of the church, like Kenmore's trees, they threatened potential damage. Well, finding no historic justification for their presence, the trees, along with some tall shrubbery, were removed. The church has since undergone an exterior restoration, enabling its striking architecture to be properly appreciated without interference from overpowering vegetation. But you can't win them all. While not looking, misguided good intentions succeeded in skirting the church with balls of boxwood and some scrawny shrubs. What compels people to do this? Is this just showing how much they love the building? The church gains nothing from these plantings. Now, since I am an employee of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and a graduate of the University of Virginia, I feel morally obligated to reference Thomas Jefferson in all my lectures, so I will do so by discussing my alma mater. Seen is the 1826 Tanner engraving, the earliest published depiction of Jefferson's architectural scheme, what he called his academical village. Focusing on the rotunda, we see it standing proud and clear. Sometime in the early 20th century, following the building's restoration after being gutted in an 1895 fire, four magnolias were planted in each of the rotunda's flanking courtyards. Of course, a hundred years later, they'd gotten pretty big. They were even brushing against the building. Well, the rotunda underwent another extensive restoration beginning around 2010 and completed in 2017. This project involved replacing all the systems, restoring the dome, replacing the column capitals, repairing all the exterior trim, and so on. A $50 million project. The scaffolding needed to be erected for exterior and dome repairs. The magnolias stood in the way of the scaffolding. What to do? How do we deal with these trees? No documentation revealed exactly why and by whose orders the magnolias were planted. Perhaps it was just the innate belief that column buildings require magnolias. Well, the condition of the trees was duly evaluated. The judgment was that they were in a state of decline. Several had lost any aesthetic value. The university administration concluded they needed to go, not only because of their geriatric condition, but because they hindered essential restoration work. And perhaps, most importantly, there was no good reason for their presence other than the fact that they had been there a long time. The announcement of their pending removal sparked a pandemic of arboricidophobia sweeping through the university community and throughout Charlottesville. Students, faculty, and most everybody else cried, destroying the trees violates the university's culture of environmental responsibility. They are a century old. They cannot be replaced. They must be saved. Well, faced with such temper, the university administration decided to cool it for a time. Nevertheless, the trees had no overriding significance, and they inhibited the use of the courtyards. Magnolias dropped their leaves in spring and into summer, making for messy ground at critical times. Their leaves are like plastic. They don't break down. But bottom line, 
the trees impeded an important restoration project. Well, after quietly waiting a respectable time, the magnolias discreetly and without stir were just removed one day. And surprisingly, no one noticed. Maybe they were confused by the trees in the distance. Well, the rotunda restoration has been heralded. This National Historic Landmark now attracts more visitors and gets more student use than ever. And the courtyards have been redesigned and are popular gathering places. Well, what about magnolias, a tree species that certainly has its pros and cons? So far, we've dealt with magnolia issues at Capitol Square, Brandon, and Stratford Hall. Well, let's look at a couple more places where magnolia placement raises questions. This is Oatlands, a National Trust property in Northern Virginia. Well, who's dominating the conversation here? And as for geriatric magnolias, this is Mont Repose, a former villa of the Greek royal family on the island of Corfu. Prince Philip was born here. What possibly could be so special about this misshapen and decaying specimen? Even if personally planted by the King of Greece, when can you admit the time for euthanasia has come? How much do we let sentiment dominate a decision? Well, if we must have a magnolia smack in front of a formal facade, why not treat it the way Italians sometimes do? Magnolias respond well to shaping. But we need to return to UVA. What about the landscape of the rest of the Jefferson design complex? Let's look again at the Tanner engraving published in the year of Jefferson's death. It shows the lawn with no trees, a clean classical space. Yet in 1823, Jefferson ordered a hundred young locust trees for the university. And indeed, locusts were planted on the lawn. In 1830, a professor wrote, quote, The lawn has a double row of young locust trees on each side of the lawn. In 1853, Robert Mills, who was working at the university at the time, wrote, quote, the foliage of the trees fronting the buildings on the lawn and the distance they are apart separate them to the eye and associate the idea of a city street. The bone engraving of 1856 shown here clearly shows the trees. Nevertheless, the locusts were all removed and replaced in the 1860s with a thick mix of ashes and maples, a typical Victorian palette. Well, today in summer, it's hard to perceive that there's much architecture here. And in winter, we see that the trees aren't particularly distinguished or even orderly. So the question is, should the original scheme of locusts be implemented? Do we respect Jefferson's choice of landscaping? Locusts are light and airy and wouldn't obscure the building so completely. Well, Jefferson's UVA complex is a World Heritage Site. Both its architecture and its landscape warrant consideration. The two must work together. I admit it's a thorny matter, one that goads a host of agendas and opinions. So be prepared to don thick armor if you plan to suggest removing and replacing trees on the lawn. Well, Oborosidophobia is an international phenomenon. This is the Catherine Palace at Zatsky Silo in Russia, a world-famous Baroque palace. Now note that this picture is taken from a very acute angle. As with Schönbrunn or even Brandon, the Catherine Palace formed a long architectural backdrop to an extensive formal garden spread out before it. Yet like Brandon, the effect was lost in the 19th century when rows of spruce trees were planted across the upper terraces, hiding all but the palace's center pavilion. Well, the Catherine Palace was gutted by the Nazis in World War II. Following the war, its interior was painstakingly and beautifully reinstated, and the restoration 
prompted attention to the gardens and grounds. The appropriateness of the spruce trees was discussed. Interestingly, the popular sentiment was that while Russia had been so devastated by the war, millions killed, countryside scorched, cities and towns wrecked, the spruce trees survived. They were seen as symbols of Russian resistance and resilience, so they remain. Consequently, from the bottom of the garden, one is not aware that somewhere up there is one of the longest and most magnificent palace facades in the world. But the Russians feel the spruces have their place in the story. Whether or not we agree, it's their palace and their judgment call. Sentiment has been given priority here. Well, let's now turn to another palace, Hampton Court near London. This historic view shows the two wings added to the Tudor Palace in the late 17th century by Sir Christopher Wren for King William and Queen Mary. The King William wing faces left. Laid out before it is the King's Privy Garden. Privy meaning private, not an outhouse. The King's Private Garden. The Privy Garden did indeed resemble an oriental carpet, making it a sight of delight from the palace windows. Well, Hampton Court was abandoned as a royal residence by Queen Victoria. The Privy Garden was left to its own devices. All the plantings grew very big. The garden's original design was completely lost. A 1986 fire in the palace prompted some long overdue attention to Hampton Court. The fire damage was duly repaired, but the incident also induced curators and scholars to turn attention to the grounds, specifically the Privy Garden. Since few English gardens were better documented, it was concluded that a fully accurate reconstruction was feasible. Comprehensive archaeological investigation required removal of all existing plantings. Scientific examination of some of the surviving yew trees indicated that they may have dated to the original installation but their advanced age and size meant they could not be kept. However, the archaeological work revealed the garden's original pattern as shown in the painting and confirmed by innumerable plans, plant lists, and other documents in royal archives. And so the Privy Garden was fully reconstructed, completed in 1995, a glorious project. A note. The width of the central path is aligned with the central pavilion of the palace facade. Now, consider this oblique view. Does this remind us of anything? Let's go back for a look at the Bodleian plate engraving of the Wren building and compare it with Hampton Court. So, who were the patrons of Hampton Court? Well, King William and Queen Mary. Who were the patrons of the Wren building? Well, King William and Queen Mary, it was a royal commission. Who designed Hampton Court's wings? Sir Christopher Wren. Who designed the Wren building? Sir Christopher Wren, or at least his office did, and it's always been known as the Wren building. Who designed the Privy Garden? The King's royal gardener. And who was responsible for the Wren building's garden at the College of William and Mary? the king's royal gardener's assistant. In 1694, John Evelyn wrote, quote, His Majesty's gardener here has arranged to have an ingenious servant of his sent to Virginia on purpose to make and plant the garden designed for the new college, newly built in your country, unquote. Also, we have two contemporary descriptions. The 1732 description of the college states, garden planted with evergreens kept in good order. And a 1777 description states tellingly, quote, at the front of the college is a large courtyard ornamented with gravel walks and trees cut into different shapes. 
Archaeological investigations have verified the layout of the paths and plantings as shown in the Bodleian engraving. And I think it's safe to say that the Wren Building Garden was the most important public garden in colonial America. As for its layout, we see a large-scale version of this scheme that once existed at Wren's Chelsea Hospital in London. And we have a strikingly similar layout at the Lower Belvedere in Vienna. Let's compare the two. So the Wren Building's garden was in step with what was going on at the highest levels in Europe. Regrettably, the garden disappeared by the 1850s. This rare photo, taken prior to a 1859 fire, shows the Wren Building in its original colonial state, but with the colonial garden replaced with what appears to be Atlantis trees. This native of China, was introduced to America in the 1780s and was regarded as a beautiful garden specimen. Little did they realize they were unleashing a botanical plague. This post-Civil War photo shows the Wren building remodeled after yet another fire, this one set by Union troops. We see a scattering of trees along with two diagonal walks flanking a central one, but none of the trees appear to be Atlantis. In the late 1920s, along with the restoration of Colonial Williamsburg, the Wren Building, having burned three times, was restored to its colonial appearance under the direction of Colonial Williamsburg architects. Fortunately, the building's original 17th century brick walls survived the fires, so we can still claim the Wren Building to be the oldest collegiate building in the country. But the Wren Building's front campus became endowed with even more trees. And this drawing by Arthur Shirtliff, Colonial Williamsburg's landscape architect, shows how he envisioned the Wren Building setting, an abundance of trees. I'm guessing, because Shirtliff was from Boston and a graduate of Harvard, he must have had in mind the Harvard Yard, the archetype traditional collegiate campus. Well, let's look at the Harvard Yard. Trees helter-skelter and paths laid wherever students walked. So we have William and Mary today, not that different, and not great trees. And this is a winter view. The Wren Building is barely visible. I broached the subject of reconstructing the Colonial Garden with William and Mary officials. So far, the only action taken is the removal of the two box bushes flanking the Wren Building's entrance. At least it's a start, so maybe someday. And as for trees obscuring historic architecture, I want to return to my hometown in Richmond and say a word about a pet peeve. And this involves Bradford pear trees. We see a row of late 19th century houses on Richmond's West Franklin Street, a historic district listed on the National Register. The owner of the middle house thought it would add to the scene by planting in front two small, flowering, fast-growing Bradford pear trees. Well, Bradford pear trees are the horror of contemporary landscaping. They were a late introduction from China, not becoming commercially available until the 1960s. Not only have they become invasive, this rapidly growing, very dense tree does nothing but mask buildings and street facades. Their unpleasant smelling white blossoms barely last a couple of days. So fast forward just a few years to the row of houses. These are the two Bradford pears. Bradfords are best maintained with a chainsaw and chipper. They are not the quick-fix ornamental they have been sold as. They can ruin the character of a historic streetscape. Well, thankfully, the Bradfords have since been removed, and we now have saner landscaping. And because of their weak growth structure, Bradfords are notoriously prone to splitting in high winds and storms. This is what happened to one Bradford just around the corner from my own home. And it was not the only Bradford in the neighborhood so wrecked by the storm. The Bradfords illustrate 
a common tendency that we must guard against. That is, as I implied earlier, introducing trees and other landscaping to show how much we love a place. For example, Shaco Slip, a picturesque little urban piazza in downtown Richmond. Its focal point is a fountain originally used for watering the teams of horses that brought goods to warehouses here. It's a very Italian-like scene, as it looked in 1975. But Shaco Slip has since become one of downtown's hottest venues. Its buildings now house bars, restaurants, shops, and studios. So to show how much we love this charming corner of town, it got trees. This is a January photo. These trees don't shed their leaves in winter. So the picturesque old backdrop building is permanently masked. And since this is Richmond, the fountain is now graced with balls of boxwood. We're back where we started. Needless gentrification. The special character of this urban space was utterly misunderstood. And so to make a point, if you had to name the most revered and popular urban space in the world, what would it be? I think a major contender would be St. Mark's Square in Venice. This is a landscape space just as much as Central Park, but there's not a single plant here. Landscape can also mean an absence of plants. Call it hardscape if you must, but it is a manipulation of open space. It's a legitimate alternative, a conscious choice. Landscaping requires creative restraint as much as a layering of plants. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that I have a tree phobia. Far from it. Trees are essential to life, and they enrich the quality of our built environment. What could be more exhilarating than the Central Park Mall with its stately parade of elms? God knows how they have survived the blight. Or Savannah's streets and squares replete with live oaks laden with Spanish moss. Savannah's trees are so important to the city's image that the health and maintenance of its trees are monitored by computer programs. Or what could be more stately than the Allee of Italian Cypresses in the gardens of Greystone Manor in Beverly Hills, where the ICAA holds its summer studios? And what would Oak Alley be if it lost its oaks? Well, what about magnolias? They can be beautiful trees. I have nothing against magnolias if planted in the right place. Regrettably, our most famous magnolia, planted 200 years ago by President Andrew Jackson on the south side of the White House, suffered such decline and became so dangerously weakened that it was recently removed. A sad loss. However, anticipating its demise, healthy offshoots have been nurtured so that one of its offspring can be planted in its place. So to wrap things up, I would now like to offer some concluding observations and reiterations learned from the examples we've considered. Many of my remarks about the treatment of various gardens and landscapes discussed in these two sessions are based on personal observation, and admittedly many of my comments are subjective ones. But I don't want to give the impression that there are absolute right and wrong ways to treat gardens and landscapes. Fashions and attitudes change. Every situation is different, and every place has its own set of circumstances. For historic properties, however, I feel strongly that we have a responsibility to exhibit what is, to the best of our knowledge, a credible historic character. The purpose of a museum, especially one involving a significant historic place, is to educate, not to display current fashion or personal taste. And we've noted that the 18th century aesthetic was to create a disciplined relationship between architecture and landscape. A defining feature of this approach was the absence of any foundation planting, resulting in a synergy between building and grounds, often emphasized by having the width of the approach walk 
reflect the width of the building's central architectural feature, be it a portico or a central pavilion. We see this in the facade of Wimpole Hall, a historic English country house. This doesn't mean that 20th or even 21st century Georgian style or Georgian revival works should preclude any landscaping against the base of the building. Indeed, it's rare to see fine examples of American Georgian revival houses devoid of any foundation planting. Such plantings, if carefully considered, can make for an image that's visually inviting and more settled into the scenery. We see this effect in two 1930s Georgian revival houses, Mount Sharon, shown here, and Grellin, both in Virginia's Orange County. And it's not to say that a historic house that's privately owned should have no foundation planting. Ideally, such plantings should be carefully selected and maintained plantings for a settled-in look. We can't object to Anfield's discreet foundation shrubbery, though it's likely that it had no such plantings when this 18th century house was originally completed. What we also noted that many 18th century garden designs followed a rigid geometric formality, expressing the idea of man's control over nature a concept rooted in the Renaissance. The reconstructed garden of the governor's palace, based on the design shown in the Bodleian plate engraving, well illustrates this practice. Yet, as we see in the famous colonial garden at Middleton Place in South Carolina, nature has, over the years, been able to weave its own special effects on the garden's character, one that you wouldn't want to alter. And we also noted that an 18th century design principle was to have the residence serve as an architectural screen or backdrop to the formerly laid out garden before it. We see this in tiny scale at the mid 18th century Smithsfort Plantation in Virginia, or on royal scale at Herrenhausen Palace in Hanover, Germany, a World Heritage Site. And I should note that this palace and its garden were destroyed in World War II. Both have been faithfully reconstructed. And we considered issues involving the grounds of the College of William and Mary and the University of Virginia, both significant historic sites. However, for a number of the country's historic campuses, the treatment issues are not so clear-cut. An 1807 illustration of the historic old brick row of Yale College, now Yale University, gives little suggestion of any landscape design at all, just a bare yard behind the fence and tree-lined street. However, as shown in this 1891 print, the old campus had become brimming with American elms. They were part of the widespread planting of elms throughout the community, giving New Haven the moniker City of Elms. Tragically, nearly all of New Haven's American elms succumbed to Dutch elm disease, as of nearly all the elms throughout the country. Yale's old campus today is a pleasant space, but is of no special distinction from a historic landscape point of view. It's defined chiefly by its buildings, including the 1752 Connecticut Hall on the left. So perhaps Yale's old campus is best kept this way, unless a more imaginative but compatible scheme is someday proposed. Likewise, an 18th century view of Nassau Hall at Princeton University, then college, shows only a square yard enclosed by a fence, probably to keep out wandering livestock. We see no landscaping other than a simple fringe of low plantings against the fence. But by 1821, the yard had become a veritable orchard of trees bisected with parallel walks. Today, Nassau Hall's front campus has a more formal pattern of walks, but only a random planting of trees. The current layout of walks and trees is not unlike that currently at William and Mary's Wren Building. However, there is no reason to think that Princeton's historic campus should be treated other than it is now. It preserves the nostalgic, park-like image typical of most American campuses. We also noted 
at the beginning of this series that historic landscapes and gardens are not natural. They are controlled spaces. If not controlled, they cease to perform as intended. A vivid contemporary example of lack of control is tattooing, a summer estate of the Greek royal family near Athens, seen here in happier times. It was abandoned when the royal family was deposed and exiled in 1974. Well, this is how it appeared in 2007. The Greek government has since settled with the family regarding tattoo, but indecision has inhibited any action. With no control, nature has been the winner here. So all of this leads to a final reminder. When evaluating the relationship of landscape to historic architecture, always determine the appropriate historic effect to be conveyed. Ask yourself what is supposed to be doing the speaking, whether it's buildings or landscaping. In either case, they should always be engaged in civil discourse. I'm Calder Loth, and I hope the images seen and the comments heard in this presentation will give you a more informed eye for appreciating and perhaps treating or managing landscapes and gardens, and even designing compatible landscape settings for new traditional architecture. And finally, I wish to offer my thanks to the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art for making this presentation possible.